Welcome back, everybody, to the Omniverse Comics Guide podcast. We are your Omniverse Comics Guide guys. Everybody that's live on Twitch with us, thank you for joining us. If you're listening on or watching on YouTube, don't forget to hit that rate and subscribe button, thumbs up, share the show. It always helps. Believe me, that's the best thing you could do to help the show. And if you're listening on any podcast platform, subscribe and review it as well. Tell us what you like about it. Tell us what you don't like about it. Share the show. Get it out there. We appreciate it. Uh, and of course, as always, the omniversecomics.guide website is the number one place to go for reading orders. It helps me with planning my own episodes. Can I tell you I use it for a cheat? Dave's, <laughs> Dave's list helped me tell him what I think people should read. <laughs> So That's there so you go. Good. That's Omniverse oh. Comics Guide for you. Dave, my friend. Hello. How you doing, buddy? I'm good, thanks. Eric, how are you, man? What's been going on? Do, how, do, how was your wrestling? Did you win? We won. <laughs> yeah, I love when you ask, did you win? Yeah, it was It was a fun night. Me and my pal had a good time. Wrestling uh, with each other in your yeah, living room. Wrestling. You and your pal. <laughs> Me and my pal. <laughs> we won. <laughs> you both no, won, it was good. ultimately. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. The uh, it was a cool event because the the main event wrestlers were guys that were they're they're older now, but they are from Toronto, oh. so it was like a return home, and they were best friends growing up. Like that's kind of been their storyline. They were childhood buddies that got into wrestling together. Yeah, right. They were a tag team, so now they're like worst enemies. And they're having their showdown back home. Like it's, it was, you know, the storyline was comic book cheesy as it gets. So we had a great time. <laughs> Brilliant. Yes. What have you been up to? What have, uh, what's new and exciting? What are you reading? What's, what, what are you reading? reading? Do you know what? Yeah. I've, I've read so much Batman lately. I've fallen into a bat trap. So, but I've kind of gone bat. quite modern ish. Okay. So okay. My, when is that? What would you consider modern ish? At the minute 2020. So I'm, I'm spoilers because I'm doing Joker war so I can do a decent reading order. I did look up some even on the DC app and they're all like, what? <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. So yeah, I, I just, I've, I don't know. I'm so loving DC. And I keep saying this every episode where we talk about what you're reading, what you're reading. It's always DC at the minute, but I want to wrap that up for a bit and dive into some other publishers soon so yeah next time you ask it's going to be a whole load of other stuff yeah i'm i'm so tempted to get into like a character or you know sort of i don't want to say office but like you know you got the batman office or the suit and then you got all the related characters Mm -hmm. i'm so tempted to do that but i'm trying to mix up as much as possible because of the, the the structure of episodes you want to mix up like read a little this read a little that you know this little this writer because i really want to just go down to peter david rabbit hole so, so tempted I. yeah i got the the Janice vell captain marvel i keep mentioning the x factor no not yet i'm in the middle of i zombie oh brilliant in the middle yeah. how are you finding it i'm really i'm i'm enjoying it quite a bit good i'm trying to i'm trying to complete one more omnibus in march that's my goal nice it's a short one right but yeah i'm trying to get through a couple more more of the things on my shelf that have yeah. been kind of sitting there. Let me read that stuff, and because I'm so excited to read some of the things I bought. Yeah, but there's. So and I many. always remember you saying, "Read what you want to read. Just read what you want." Yeah. yeah. And I'm like, yeah. Listen to Dave. He knows. I'm gonna take off my glasses because the glare is driving me crazy. Ah, that's right. Oh hi, I see hi. you there. Hello, there I am. <laughs> it was you all along. <laughs> all right. Today's topic, you came up with a good idea to do some 90s X-Men, and I said, it's appropriate. And I'm very scared of X-Men as a topic. <laughs> An X-Men All fans, the because they'll go, no! What? That. Yeah, that's part of it, too. Okay, you've read, like, a, like everything <laughs> up until Secret Wars. Like, not Secret Wars, uh, Avengers X-Men, would you say, like... The majority um, of that X Men you've read. I'm trying to think if there's something I haven't read from that period, and I can't think. I think like one or two issues of New Mutants, Truth or Dare. That that was it. <laughs> I've read everything else from like m- at least mid '80s up to Avengers vs X Men. Oh no, up to Secret Wars. Yeah. But you've also you've also read uh, 
from giant you read like the giant x-men oh yeah yeah from there up yeah i didn't like the so 60s you've... stuff but from in terms yeah i've i've read pretty much all of it yeah you see for me i've if there's a there was like lists of the 50 greatest x-men stories or you know and i've read the majority uh-huh. in some capacity but then there's these big chunks around the the x-men universe that is just like oh i, I haven't read that yet like there's a lot though it's a lot and that's the thing. You always get people who will say, how have you not read that? How have you not included that? How have you not? And the thing is, one thing, we don't necessarily have to like it just because it's popular. That's true. We don't have to include it just because people think you should include it. And also, there is so much stuff to slot in. Never mind just X-Men. There's everything else out there. You know, it's finding the time. So you know, never, never let anyone tell you you should be ashamed for not having read Paul Smith's run on X Men, but you should be obviously because that's the greatest X Men. <laughs> yeah, no, it's uh, I love I love doing. I'm scared and I love it because it reminds me of how much fun I had when I did read the these X Men stories in spurts. Mm. Because there was a time where they didn't have the epic collections that would button up all the in betweens. There was always like felt like orphaned issues because you get yeah. a, a Bishop's Crossing. Um, trade or mm -hmm. an extinction extinction agenda trade. Yes, and and it was all, you know, the story. Yeah, the meat and potatoes of it. But there was the things mutant in potatoes. Between, the mutant <laughs> potatoes. But there was always stuff in between that was like, yeah, they wouldn't include it. So it was like they wouldn't include it. We'll so do it the event, gaps. but we won't do the build up to the event. But the build up's the best bit sometimes. And so when you yeah, so reading the the in betweens was like, oh, that epic comes out now, and I can fill in the void that they didn't have before collected, mm -hmm. right? So that's kind of been my X Men reading experience, which I've loved. But uh, yeah, I've I I'm I'm excited to hear your choices because it's gonna. I think I'm gonna go down an X Men rabbit hole very soon. Oh, dangerous! A lot to a dangerous, dangerous hole to uh, to get stuck in. The <laughs> I go first this you time? You go first. Do it. I'm going to go with a big storyline, but one issue from it. Okay. And it is from – I'm going to say it's from the Fatal Attractions book because this oh. is where I read it out of. But it's X-Factor issue 87. <laughs> Was that on your list? <laughs> no, but it, oh. I hovered on it so many times, so I'm really glad you picked it. Okay. So the reason why I, I really enjoy this storyline as a whole, but that issue in particular was – I had this uh, this collection on my shelf for a while. Got it for a good deal. I said I'm going to read it one day. And I and while everybody, you know, while the world shut down and I had some extra time on my hands, is when I started to really read uh, Omnis, mm -hmm. because this book I enjoyed being able to read a little bit of every book that was happening around that time, in some sequential order for it all to make sense. Yeah. And it made me appreciate that cover to cover experience of an omnibus that. I didn't have that much reading experience in, very sporadic. And so I kind of got hooked on it because of this. Uh, it's not an omnibus, but it's like a Marvel hardcover. But anyways, in that issue, X Factor 87 was on paper. I wasn't as interested in the X Factor team because yeah. I didn't know the characters. I wanted to know the characters I've grown to love and familiar with, the A team. But that Doc Samson and all of the – the different ways you got to know the psyche of all of those characters on the team and kind of, I don't remember it all, but I remember uh, reading it and being like, I'm into this book. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm in, Yeah, this is good stuff. And it's Joe Casada, Peter yeah. David. And you're realizing too, like, okay, this is a really cool moment of comic book creation in the nineties. You got a, a Joe Casada is an artist, artist. You yes, know? absolutely. It's, it's funny as well. Cause like people, I think pe where people, do I don't want to go over and over and retread that whole thing of like people dismissing the 90s. But there was a lot of bombastic storytelling in the 90s. And this is like the opposite of that. The art is is great. And for such a detailed book and for an artist who's really good at that action stuff, it's not the action stuff. It's, it's character stuff. So and I think he's really good at those facial expressions as well. But it's Peter David taking the time with the characters. That's what he does best. They're the best stories with him. Yeah. That's what makes yeah, you care. It, yeah. And and it was one of those uh, moments of reading where you realize when all the – when a whole team of like 
associated with X-Men, all the books associated with it, everybody's kind of working together. It's a, a special moment in time because you mm-hmm. know it, things change and chemistry will change. But when it's all working and you got like you go to Peter David on X-Factor while he's on the Hulk, too, it's like this yeah. is – this is choice stuff. And it's, again, the Doc Samson connection to the Hulk. So when I was getting to that point in my Hulk reading, I it brought back to mind like, oh, yeah, he – Doc Samson shows up as the – is he a psychiatrist yeah. or a psychologist? Uh, let's say psychiatrist. I, I don't know what the difference is. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. If anyone's a psychiatrist, a... psychologist watching. Right. All Correct of you. us on the, on the chat, please. But, yeah, it was, it was good stuff. And it's, it's a moment within the – whole scope of the storyline mm. which i'm sure you can pluck and pick other key stuff from that that era but yeah that was one for me that i didn't expect to like yeah and i was just like this is good i'm happy i'm reading all of this together because i probably would have ignored x factor yeah it's great it's a really good shout it's a really popular issue for good reason like, and and funny enough, if you read the later X Factor stuff with X Factor Investigations, and now off the top of my head, I can't remember what issue it is, but they do do a follow up to that issue in that series with with that team. So that's quite nice. That callback is quite nice, and it's a very nice. different setup because they're such a different team, and the vibe of the book is different. But that's the best thing as well about having a a series with D list characters because they were he got all the the ones that didn't fit into the X Men Genesis relaunch and X Force and. Excalibur and everything else that was running at that time, he got the ones that were left over. So like, he had more freedom to play with them and grow them and, you know, see them develop. Right. So, and yeah, that's, it makes that's the best part of having those those characters because you're allowed. Yeah. And it and it's one of those uh, moments. It's like you realize how dangerous it is to. It's such a great experience. I don't want to be uh, negative in any way, but with the X-Men, it's like these characters that i wouldn't think i like yeah. i'm almost more interested yeah in some of them because of the way they're being developed and like that's such an interesting power they have or an interesting relationship they connect with everybody so yeah it's it's that's a moment in time where the all the connecting stories make you realize like everybody had to be all the gears had to be turning together yes and it's good it's good stuff it's great stuff actually uh, omega bread says psychiatrists can prescribe medication psychologists can't so there we go if you if you don't learn anything about comics tonight or the x-men you've at least learned that thanks ob um and he also says that uh valerie cooper's in- interview where she describes the team's personalities as the complete opposite of what they are was expertly set up like that's so that was such good observation thanks man i forgot about that bit because it's been so long since yeah, i've read too. it yeah but that's yeah, the, exactly. it's so layered 22 pages of, of incredibly layered storytelling for a throwaway dollar and comic book you know yeah and those are the things about comics where people kind of dismiss the information or the storytelling that you can get from it because you're still getting that moment of psychiatric treatment and getting into people's way of thinking. And yeah. a lot of times the writers will look into those little maybe sciences or pseudosciences that they're going to include in their story. That's like, you yeah. know, that kind of is actually being studied. It's not completely made up in his head. And you learn stuff as a reader. Like that's yeah. that's those are the mo- those are the comics where you're like, you see. That's why we read the whole book. <laughs> we read to learn. Plus, yeah. fighting and boobies. <laughs> Thanks, X Men. <laughs> How could you go wrong, Peter David? <laughs> How Joe could Pisata? you go wrong? Right. Speaking of fighting and boobies, this it's one issue. It's Uncanny X Men two six nine, and it is the issue where Rogue returns from the Siege Perilous after Fall of the Mutants. The X Men kind of went through a, a portal and were in Australia and the world thought they were dead, but they weren't. And people, they couldn't be registered on any technology and all this kind of stuff. So they came out and they started a new life. Cut ahead to when they had to go through it again. So a number of them went through it at different times. Rogue was one of the first, I think, to go back through. And it took her ages to come out. And so in this issue, she she appears in the, <laughs> in the nip. There was a great conversation nip. some people were having in the nip. There were some great conversations people were having about how pervy the X-Men seemed to be under Jonathan Hickman. And they went like, Chris Claremont wouldn't have had this in his day. I think, have you read a Chris Claremont issue of X-Men? <laughs> like, right. It's full of it. Like as a kid, I wouldn't let on some my I wouldn't let my parents see 
the pages of my X-Men comics because some of them were quite risque. And everyone seemed to be shagging. It was very kind of open, like sexually uh, liberated as a series that was Comics Code approved. <laughs> what? So in this they issue, selling. they were selling, man. And I always made sure I bought my X-Men. Rogue comes back. She ends up in the Savage Land and she's kind of stranded there. Before then, when she first appeared, she absorbed Ms. Marvel's personality. And in this, they finally deal with that. So she absorbed Ms. Marvel's memory, Carol Danvers' memories and her abilities. And this time, she's come through the Siege Perilous and that personality has been given form. So she's constantly being chased by Ms. Marvel or a version of her, an embodiment of her persona. But before then, they used to have it so that Ms. Marvel's persona would kind of sometimes take over and they'd be talking to Carol, but it would be Rogue's body. So it was a very strange setup, but for quite a long time, it's just basically her fighting for survival. She's fighting this almost zombified version of Ms. Marvel. So, it, you know, someone's got to win. You probably know who it's going to be. And at the end of it, there's a there's a big surprise as to who else is in the Savage Land with her. Or is it that big a surprise? I don't know. But even that then leads to something else. Like, what's this? What's happening? Why is he here? Are they going to fight? Are they going to be enemies? And it builds to another storyline later. Plus, in this one, there's a load of hints of things to come, which I'm probably going to talk about in a bit. But this is just one of those great issues because it's got the ridiculous over sexualization of characters which was perfectly acceptable at the time the action is there art uh, t-bear does the inks on top of jim lee as well so it's jim lee's art uh, it's not scott williams as it had been for quite some time mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and i think it was better with his inks mm. so it's it feels a little more kind of i hate using the term cartoonish but it's sort of that it's a great issue and it's a it's a tipping point for that character because from that point on rose role and her character is different she's a big chunk of what she's been for a long time is gone so it's a and that's the thing it had lasting impact one issue yeah that's the kind of they're the kind of comics i I miss in in mainstream comics because it tends to rehash from this point you know yeah yeah no it's it's part of the fun of going back retroactively and reading a lot of this stuff in chunks where sometimes it feels weird and disjointed because of the way you're used to reading modern day graphic novels or mm. things that are built to be read in a six issue format. Yeah. You had so much packed into a single issue back then. And by the end of 12 issues, you're like, wow, I've lived through so much with these characters. And there was something happened. Something would have happened in one of those 12 books within the year. That was like a key moment. Yeah. You know, yeah. and it's, it's and like both of us have just mentioned issues so far. I thought we would. I was tempted to be like this honk of a honker of a <laughs> omnibus, all of it. You That's know, but thing. it's like there's so much to pick at. No, there it's is good. so much good to pick. pick. Yeah, yeah. Number two for me. Go for it. Okay, I'm gonna go with Extinction Agenda. What I remember about this book, it reminds you of how international the X Men team is. And where there's certain mutant issues that are not just like happening in New York City or within that vicinity of like the eastern seaboard of yeah. the United States of America. <laughs> like in this case, they're going to Genosha. And I love the, the, the era in time where the X-Men and X-Factor, sometimes they would cross paths. I think where's the first time that they realize they exist? Is it in front? Um, they see each other from a distance just before Mutant Massacre, but they don't right. meet. And then Inferno, they meet for the first time. x Factor originally thought, because Magneto was a member of the team, they thought they kind of turned bad. Right. So they kind of that's how they kept them apart. Right, right. And the other guys are going, so, oh, they're mutant hunters. So like, that's how they, they kind of separated the two titles. Yeah, it was such an interesting way of like making them almost cross paths. Yeah. It's like there's, it's all the X-Men. They're all X-Men, but having them to like... Nope, we, we almost saw them. We didn't see them. It was it was fun. Jeez. It was fun to read that. Yeah, constantly. Yeah, the, the international issue of mutants and how it's handled in different places and, and also the education that you could get from comic books for world affairs. They were pretty hitting you on the head with it, but also in a way where the X-Men were such a good metaphor, allegory for whatever is happening in time. Yeah. If you read it, understanding the time or the decade that the stories are being written in, you're like, oh, this was what was happening as a world issue. Yeah. There's a metaphor here. Yeah. So uh, this story kind of has that element to it. I don't want to spoil it any more than that, but it's a uh, great art. I think it's, is it still Mark? Who's, who's in the 285s? 
or the two seventies of maybe. Uncanny. That's Jim Lee. Jim Lee, yeah. classic Jim Lee. So you like get three is issues Jim... of Jim Lee, I think, and then you yeah. get two Liefeld and a guest artist on New Mutants. Then you get John Bogdanov, who was the the tricky one for this because some people hated it on X Factor. Yeah. It depends. I find it depends who's inking him when True. he's at Marvel. So when when it was his art on Fantastic Four versus the X Men, and it was Terry Austin inking him, it worked brilliantly. I think he had Al Milgram on those issues, and Milgram's inks are quite. Yeah, <laughs> you know, so it's a, it's a bit scrappier, and I can understand some people not being overly keen on it because a lot of his stuff is kind of more caricature esque. But I don't know. I think one of the things I really like about this story. So I'm kind of I'm all over the place on this story. Sometimes I like it, sometimes I don't. But one of the things that's brilliant about it for me is just the villain himself, because it is that that total lack of self-awareness about how he wants to destroy these freaky mutants, but he is basically a head attached to a disturbing cyborg body that's almost spider-like, and it's the creepiest thing. It's, it's brilliantly creepy. The, the, the character design for Cameron Hodge at that point, because originally he was just some dude. He was the guy who was working with X-Factor. To, he was the one that suggested that they go that route. So that's it's right, real progression right, for right. that character. Before yeah. Extinction Agenda, so it was just before Inferno, <clears throat> that was when Archangel fought him. And and that's why he looks the way he does in an Extinction Agenda is because Archangel chopped his head off a few years earlier. That makes sense. Yes, yeah, see, it's all coming back to me now. All in chunks. Because I think I read... I may have read the Extinction Agenda story... And then I might have jumped back and I had read the Dissolution. Uh, it's the trade called Dissolution. Uh, Rebirth and, and Dissolution? That one when they're in Australia. Yeah. And I kind of read them crisscrossing because I had read Follow the Mutants. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so I had read I had read Follow the Mutants, both of the, the trades that collected that story, and then jumped ahead and did it. Like it was all kind of crisscrossing in my head, but – you put the pieces together as you're explaining yeah. the stuff that happened. And it's just, it's so much fun sometimes to even go back in time and be like, Ooh, I know who that. Yeah. That Cause I'm seeing him do it. The buildups were great. They could be years in the making in those days, you know? Yeah. Whereas they, they might be a why year. Meant so much <laughs> now. Yeah. If we're lucky. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So that's my number two. Nice. Check that out. If you haven't, uh, I'm sure most of the, the folks on the, tw- on the Twitch have, but, well, it's a good one. there's some it's there's some nice comments. Mechanic. I don't want to move too far forward before mentioning some of these because there's some really nice yes. stuff in here. And um, a PC Scrubs is saying it's the perfect example of not needing a jumping on point issue because that's what he did. This was the story that started him in in reading X Men. Um, he was saying about the allegory for allegory for South Africa as well in the story, which as a as a kid I had no idea. I didn't know anything. I lived in my own little fantasy land, and it was lovely, just riddled with mutants. Omega Brad said, did Cameron Hodge appear again after this? He did. He was a member of the Phalanx. So he was one of the first members of the Phalanx that we saw around about. Um, it was, I think it's in Fatal, the Fatal Attractions collected edition that you've got there. He does appear in there. So And then later on, um, he comes back in. in Second Coming as well. But he looks like his Extinction Agenda self. So this event brings back a whole load of, well, this and, Uncan- um, and X-Force, not Uncanny X-Force. The series before it, X Force, he comes back in that, and Bastion brings a lot of people back. Celine, uh, it's all it's it's convoluted. I'll do a thing <laughs> at some point. <laughs> yeah, Mar- Marvel Man had mentioned that uh, Cameron Hodge appeared again in Felix Covenant oh, as well. Shout out to Marvel Man. Thank, thank you. you, thanks, dude. You're absolutely right. Yes, so it's it's a great choice. It's a popular choice. I'm I'm always kind of eh, the life felt though, and the 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 Bogdan over. I'm not sure, but the Jim Lee, stuff, the the fight between Wolverine and Archangel as well is great. That's a great moment. Yeah, yeah. No, it's fun stuff. Okay, Dave, take it away. I'll show you my bits. It's Generation X numbers one to three for my number two. So it's the first story arc from Generation X. So this follows on from Phalanx Covenant. It's really nice stuff. It's well, I think it's one of the first titles, mainstream big titles that Chris Bacciolo drew. I think before that he was on Ghost Rider twenty ninety nine. There may have been some other things in between there as well. I know he did some some um, Legends of the Dark Knight issues and stuff like that. But this was in terms of Marvel, this was like a big launch. So it came out of Phalanx Covenant, the the phal- the the techno organic alien phalanx who had merged with some humans were hunting down mutants and they were trying to find the next generation of mutants hunt them down so that was in that storyline 
and that essentially becomes the team that becomes generation x so it's the it was at the time in the 90s the modern new mutants they were all getting on a bit so they needed a new bunch and what was brilliant about these as well is they've got such odd powers the new mutants looking at them just look like a bunch of teenagers for the most part no one's particularly freaky apart from warlock who's a bit of a cheat but with this team you've got chamber who's missing most of his face and part of his chest whereas his powers have exploded like psionic abilities have exploded part of his body you've got page guthrie guthrie however you pronounce it where she can rip off her own skin and there's a different skin underneath like it might be rock skin diamond skin whatever it might be uh depending on what power she needs at the time you've got someone called skin as well who's got really stretchy skin you've and this storyline introduces uh penance as well who can't be touched she's too pointy she's uh yeah she really makes you feel a prick so there's there's also the first time that emma frost is properly one of the good guys so her and banshee are running the school and it's the Massachusetts Academy. Before, they were the, the villains for the New Mutants for most of the 80s. And then the, the her class were murdered by Sentinels. Teenage murder, that's what you need in your comics. Then she was kind of, instead, she was a sexy teacher. But for the good guys this time. Like, okay. X-Men comics aren't kinky at all, are they? BC Scrubs just reminded me as well. I was going to talk about this and I totally forgot because I had the issue on screen. But it was, it had the chromium cover, the chrome cover. So it was like a silver, like a metallic Mm -hmm. cover. I'm desperate for them to release at least the first chunk of Generation X as an Omni. I'm desperate. I don't own the issues anymore. I sold my my singles. And I'm really hoping that that's... We talked about this recently, about them having those uh, gimmick covers on Omnibuses. Mm -hmm. I Mm -hmm. really, really hope they do a Chromium dust cover for Generation X. That would be so appropriate. Yeah. Yeah, it would be. And uh, plus, their their villain in this thing as well, incidentally, was uh, M-Plate, who was the most goth-looking villain you could get. It was great. This was perfectly 90s, but without being, you know, the way people use 90s as a swear word. It was a great book. Scott Lobdell had stopped trying to be Chris Claremont by this point. Um, So he had great art. I really like the writing, whatever you may think of Lobdell. And it's it's a fun teen book without the characters being overly annoying. And there's so much promise as well for what was to come. So it, it didn't remain great forever, but I would say like the first 30, 30 35 issues are um, pretty strong. Nice. Nice pick. I haven't read that. See, that's one of the blind spots for me. I've read up to, what's the team up with the Avengers? Which, which In the one? 90s? In the 90s? The, uh, Blood Ties? The Blood Ties. I read up to there. Right. And I got to go into the, the Cyclops and Phoenix. and oh, I, I read that. Oh, the issue, wedding. Actually. Yeah. yeah no wonder you stopped <laughs> i can't deal with that issue it's i was about if you've to chosen it, it tonight i'm so sorry i was about to pick it but we'll go with something else <laughs> Nine number three so we don't have to make dave sick to his stomach you can choose it if it's what you want man choose it no just as a cat uh, as a as a tangent i think for me what i i haven't read that entire omnibus like not even close but I read that one issue just as to read the, you know, the wedding of key characters of the team. But, but the thing I like about those issues, it's like the baseball games or the when the team has that quiet down moments and people are just living life. Hmm. That's the aspect that I liked about it. And it was a key moment in the the trajectory yeah. of the team. But I'll pick something else that's Dude. key to the 90s. No, no, no. I'm going to go with Bishop's Crossing. And the art is that team... A lot of the team that would go on to be the the core of Image Comics, you got Wills Portacio on his time at X-Men. It's uh, it's Bishop's first appearances in the X-Men world. You know how the X-Men are always got those time displacement moments yeah. and storylines that affect them. So now you've got, I guess it's almost uh, the Legion of Superhero effect where someone from the future who looks back on these characters in such high regard and now he's trapped in their era and getting to know who exactly they are. In that same frame of where you're, where, who I am in the future is inspired by who I think you guys are now. But now I'm part of this current team. How does that affect time? How do, do I get back? Do I stay? How does this all work out? What yeah. What is my role now? So, I mean, Bishop is a, is a key character, beloved character. A lot of actors have uh, mentioned that they would play him if they could. Have they? I know like Method Man. I, I think Method Man has said, like, if they want me to play Bishop, I'm I'm going to the gym ready to do the, the role. Really? With with yeah. mullet or without? Or has he not said? 
I'm not sure, but I know that Method Man is a hardcore comic fan, so he would probably be like, I'll do the mullet if I got to. Damn. Speaking of Bishop, I should have had a my, my cup with me. I have a really cool Mike Del Mundo coffee mug that has Tupac, Dang. Shakur, in the Bishop <gasps> costume. I've seen that, I think. I've seen that picture. Yeah. 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 It's really neat because Tupac Shakur, as an actor, made his name playing a character named Bishop. Did so he? him... Yeah, in the movie Juice, that was his, that was his character's name. So it was, so, it was a perfectly like, what a cool way to like tie it in wow. all together. Because Tupac would have made a great bishop in an X Men movie. I don't know enough about him. I'll just, I'll take your word for that, dude. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's a so it's a great uh, Mike. Shout out to Mike Del Mundo for a great homage to Tupac and to Bishop. But yes, Bishop's Crossing from the X Men, it's um. Yeah, it's a it's a key era of like that that the look, the way that we kind of see X Men from the cartoons and that sort of like library that people share of Colossus and the way Gene and Storm look. It, it's that classic '90s feel right here. Yeah, and it's still it's still Claremont, right? No, Scott Lobdell. It's Scott Lobdell doing the, uh, the X Men. Yes. I think at this point. I think you're right. I think that was when he started. Initially, it was John Byrne. Actually, I think John Byrne did the first few issues. He wrote the first few yeah. issues. And then yep, Lobdell comes right. on, yeah. Th- these were the issues yeah. I read multiple times, like because I was this was when I got really obsessed with the X Men. Okay, so I've I've read them, so I'm annoying. <laughs> I'm annoying, even though I haven't read them in like 40, 30 years. I'd read it so many times because like that was when I started to really get obsessed with the continuity of it as well and put start putting things in order. Nineteen ninety one. So where does where does D- Omni Dave? hold the bishop's crossing storyline in his nostalgic reviews where do you put it nostalgic reviews in my nostalgia rating is probably four but my honest rating would be three it's, it's decent i like it yeah i was intrigued by bishop you have to have a time travel a uh, time lost mutant in the x-men and wasn't it lucky that he traveled from the future and landed in a time when mullets were in what are the Perfect. chances what are the chances Oh, Billy Ray Cyrus is a thing. <laughs> Great. That's all right. I'll keep my locks. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Yeah, it's just great cheese. 90s X-Men comic book cheesiness. I like it. It's fun. I want to read yeah. these all again. That's why I love these episodes. Don't you panic. It's not a mistake. It's time for the Omniverse Ever Break. Yeah. New to the Omniverse this week, Agent of Armor, which is an incredibly popular uh, She-Hulk related. It's not, it's not popular, but believe me, we're building to something. <laughs> Fear, Blood and Shadows is a valiant effort. It's from Shadow Man. Part one of the Valiant Reading Order is coming very soon. Also, Shadow War, which is the 2022 Batman Robin Deathstroke event. Our incoming episode from April 2024, where we talk about the stuff we're most looking forward to. Also, the big Jim Shooter interview. Uh, Eric talks to the editor-in-chief of Marvel Comics from 1978 to 87, was it? Yeah. Yep. Jim Shooter. This, this is, yeah. I mean, I'm a huge 80s Marvel guy. I know you're a big 80s Marvel guy. So this, this was, was cool. Uh, yeah, this yeah. was cool. And exclusives wise, we've got What to Read Before Spider Island, which is the 2011 Marvel Comics event. Obviously, it's Spider Man. So that's only for people who sign up to the Omniverse Comics dot guide website. That's it. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> All right, that'll awesome. do. Again, everybody, Omniverse Comics dot guide. It's uh. It's helpful. If you're a comic book fan and you want help in your reading orders and what to read next, it's great. Okay, my number three tonight is an entire beast of a book. This is X-Men Age of Apocalypse. It's one of those things that will make some people go, absolutely, yeah. And other people go, no, it's completely overrated. It's not. X-Men kind of was set in amber, I think, for a while because of the popularity of the cartoon. Whereas the 80s was always changing and they were always changing where they are and what the setup is and who was a, a team, who was in the team. And it felt like it stayed quite static for a long time when the cartoon became popular. But actually, like, 1995, they announced that Professor X was dead and the history is completely rewritten and Magneto's in charge and the timeline's completely altered. And everyone's going, is this it? Is this, is this it now? Is this permanent? 
and they actually originally announced they were going to be called the mutants which was what x-men was going to be called so in the 60s stanley and jack kirby wanted to call the series the mutants and marvel basically said you can't because no one's going to know what that means whereas like, oh let's call it x-men then everyone knows what that means anyway age apocalypse is great the bad guys have essentially won because professor x wasn't around apocalypse rose and took over america and the x-men are basically the resistance it's fantastic there's eight four issue minis and they take the eight on or seven or eight ongoing titles at the time and turn them into completely new books so cable was replaced with x-man who was a just completely new character but still the same genes <laughs> There were two X-Men books, which were Astonishing X-Men and Amazing. X Excalibur was Excalibur, and so on and so forth. And it had a whole new thing, and each you know, different members of each team were in different places, and some of them hadn't met, and Rogue was with Magneto, and they're married, and they've got a kid, and all sorts. And you're picking it apart, going, like, who's that meant to be? Because um, like, there's this army of guys called the, the Madri, I think it is, you pronounce it as, and they work for Apocalypse, and it's Jamie Madrox. So the way they play with the characters is all completely different. Dead Man Wade is this guy in Excalibur, and, but he's Deadpool. and Yeah, Wolverine is pretty... Wolverine's got a hand missing. How does that even happen? He's grown that back now. <laughs> His hand is in there going, look. Yeah. <laughs> I want to pick up the coffee mug. It's true, yeah. but it's, it's, uh, I, I, I've read it in its totality, but I haven't read it for a bit, but the, the feeling that I, I, from my memories is like every what if scenario yeah. is carried out here yeah. and There's tons of what if scenarios, the import, one of the important keys of reading this storyline, not just remember, remember it's the nineties, not that it's more the fact that they, they sold it so legit. Yeah. That like this is the new status quo. Yeah. We're not that X Men, whatever number you were reading, it's gone. It's not out anymore. It's yeah. not on the shelves. This is the new book. Mm -hmm. That story, that thing, and that's how it was sold for a, a quite a while. Yeah. And of course, looking back, you would be like, come on, they did Death of Superman, but they didn't end the Superman numbering. No. They didn't cancel essentially those books mm -hmm. and not put them out on the shelf in the next couple months so that's part of the thrill when you read through this again remember that they sold it as this is here to stay and yeah. it was every fan like x-men fans like what if dream scenario come to life it's like i was i was going to mention weapon x in this ah. one, as a pick yeah as it a, is one of the stronger titles Definitely. As an example of like, yeah, you know that that relationship. You always wonder, yeah. what if? Oh yeah, yeah. Good shout, good shout. This, this is this is gonna scratch that itch. It does this a lot though, doesn't it? All over it the does. place, number of characters. But that is one of the that is one of the better ones. There is a lead up series called Legion Quest. There's quite a chunky book, which you can get. I don't necessarily recommend this if you do read the four issue Legion Quest. Story arc, that's enough. Don't read all the other stuff. It's it's not great. And a lot of it's not necessary. But it, it just lets you understand where we where you are with it. Bishop is the we we're kind of told through the eyes of Bishop. He learns about this new age of apocalypse as the that's as right. the out of time member of the X Men. So that's he's right. kind of the the only survivor from the other timeline. And you're seeing it all through his that's, eyes. It sounds so silly to say, but as far as being an X-Men fan, the gravity of the story at the time, this was a really big deal. And it holds up because even when it's all wrapped up, cover to cover, this is like, wow. Yeah. Because it, it, they make it count. Yeah, they, they do. Made it count. They found a way to make it count. They do. Yeah. So great. Yeah. yeah. It's a, I think just as comic books go, this is one of those, even if you don't like the X-Men, give this a try. Yeah. Give it a go. Since I can't pick... Weapon X from Age right. of Apocalypse. I'm going to pick Weapon X from Barry Windsor. Oh, oh, you little trickster. <laughs> Was that on your list? Did I steal one back? Do you know what it is? I'll tell you now before. I mean, I'll let you do the talking. It's your choice. This is my this is my favorite X-Men storyline of, of the decade. Well, I'm I happy we're going to talk about it. I Please it. chime in. This was early in my Wolverine reading. I was trying to do the... Uh, the easy, the easy stuff to catch up on, like my Wolverine lore, and man, does this hold up? And to be honest, it's not overly written. 
no. but you really got to You really got to take your time and just take in the art. There's just sometimes where you're reminded. I had recently read, not related to Wolverine, but um, the Francis Manipal, Brian Buccioletto Flash. Yeah. Omni. And there's just some times where you're reminded, like, this is a visual medium. Take mm-hmm. a moment to admire the art and the storytelling. And this yeah. isn't Weapon X is a perfect example of how much story can be told with such few words and makes you kind of understand Logan. Yeah. Like, oh, that, that's what happened, huh? Well, it's, I think it's kind of quite shocking. I yeah. think I appreciate how adult, adult it is as an adult. Whereas at the time I was thinking, okay, <laughs> oh, that's quite dark. And I think when it came out as well, so it came out, it was in Marvel Comics Presents 72 to 85, I think. <laughs> And it was eight pages ago, apart from the finale, which was um, about uh, it was about twenty four pages, I think. But for the most part, it was eight pages, so you got these little snippets every two weeks. But it's a it's a weird way to read it. I think it should be read in its entirety, not not necessarily one sitting, but you know, near as damn it, because then you really appreciate it. And what they do to him is awful. And as a kid, I'm going like, okay, they did this thing, but aren't his aren't his claws cool? Yeah, look at him there. <laughs> look at his hair, isn't it big? But like, I'm reading it as an adult going like, this is horrendous what they did to that guy. And you kind of, you see him at the start and he's obviously not having the best life. There's stuff going on in his life. You don't 100% know what it is. And then it veers into this, just torture for pages and pages. <laughs> just torture. It's like, it's horrible, but it's beautiful. Barry Windsor Smith, this is probably one of Barry Windsor Smith's best books. It's haunting. Mm. And, it's, and it's not haunting in a way where there's, uh, you know, the monster under the bed or the, you know, the, what's the word? Like, it's not horror in the, in the, it's all scientific. It's all wiring. It's all. Yeah. People in, in lab coats. Again, I think yeah. as well to a point. Yeah. It's people yeah. in lab coats. That's just, and, and you're watching this and it's haunting. Mm. You're like, no wonder. Oh, um, that's the th- it's one of those things as well where, you know, when you go like, yeah, but the humans are the real monsters, that kind of, you know, and those things, it does have that. But the way he does it is it's both subtle and blatant in a really weird but perfectly balanced way. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Because even, even like the worst person in the world who's involved in it, even the others, you're kind of like, yeah, but you're letting this happen. You know, so it's it's a great it's a great story and it's visceral and it is dark and it i think the more you read it the more you get from it the ending is odd and interesting but yeah it's it's fantastic yeah, and i think it's very new reader friendly hmm. especially if you just like wolverine peripherally from like the movies like ah, i like wolverine from the cartoon like what's a good wolverine story to start with try weapon x yeah <laughs> it <laughs> Prepare won't yourself. it won't really spoil anything or right. it, it'll just get let you give you as you read maybe that first and if you went backwards and started from like reading Wolverine as the character grew popular, yeah. you would always feel like, I know something they don't know. <laughs> like you'll always read it with that in your head. Like, I know why he's like that. And that's part of the fun sometimes. Well, again, we didn't know we were ever going to get that. No. This was a big surprise. Right. And it was really su- – they threw it into Marvel Comics Presents of all things, not even Wolverine's own title or a miniseries of its own or anything. And it could have easily been too like – very prestige Windsor Smith, format. Or prestige format. Yeah. yeah. 48 yeah. page. You know, it really could have been. They were doing that back then with other uh, artists. Lot. And yeah. yeah it, so interesting choice. Maybe it was Great to boost choice. the sales of the Marvel Presents title at the time. Probably. Put him in there. But um, yeah, it, it has to be mentioned in, in 90s X-Men. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah absolutely. It's, it's an easy pick. Will yeah. it can get forgotten sometimes. So I'm really glad you mentioned it really glad because i love it thank you thank you no worries okay this is why i didn't talk too much about the fallout of age of apocalypse and i wasn't expecting to choose this and i actually changed my mind just before we went on so i've chosen x-men prime which seems like a bit of a weird choice so x-men prime was the double-sized or maybe triple-sized i'm trying to think uh, uh, double-sized one shot that came after age of apocalypse so it's set six months after that event you don't know what's going on with the X-Men. It's been a while. We haven't seen them in ages. 
Is it just business as usual? It's like, nope. And this is one of my favorite things, I think, about the X-Men. They, they've done the occasional issue, like that Rogue one, where they hint about things to come. In the very first issue of Jim Lee's X-Men, X-Men number one, they did that double page, things to come, pinup. I love that stuff. And X-Men does it a lot. And Claremont did it a lot because he, in his mind, he was staying on the book forever. So he could broadcast things ahead. This was one of these moments where they did it in this one shot. You were catching up on where everyone was and you were seeing where everything was going. And it's not one of the greatest comics of all time, but it's kind of the marker of when they really started to play with that. And they do do it probably more so now after a big event. They'll release that one shot and it'll be like, this is this is the midpoint. This kind of clears everything up and tells you what to expect in the future. Like a free comic book day type of book. Yeah, essentially. But it had a, a tr- um, acetate cover. Please put that on there. Please put that on the omnibus. So that they're going to release the X-Men Road to Omnibus Road to Onslaught Omnibus later this year, mm. Volume 1. So there will be two books, I think. I think it's going to be two. Never read Onslaught. Dude, get this first. Don't touch Onslaught yet. Get this book first. I have the three trades. You do? I've, I've collected them, the Road okay. to Onslaught, to read so that I could read the the, the actual event. Uh-huh. Again, it's one of those things, like, I want to read this, I want to read that, but do I have to read all of it before? Like... It's better yes, if you, you do. do. It's better if I you know, do. I know. And it's the build-up is years. great. Because, like, I mean, after X-Men Prime, they they did stuff like have on, um, Juggernaut just crash into the the floor, the ground somewhere. Someone had stopped the Juggernaut. Who stopped the Juggernaut? And that's one other mystery. And there was just tons of mystery building up. So one of the things X-Men Prime does is it lets you know what the fallout of Age of Apocalypse is. So you'll start to see some of those characters. So Nate Gray emerges in... 616 reality he, he kind of crash lands on earth and that's sensed by professor x you head into the morlock tunnels and you find that one of the other survivors of the age of apocalypse is in there another survivor of age of apocalypse is floating in space in like a rock thing and it's like so that isn't over just because we kind of went to a different reality for four months it's not done some of this is is continuing to affect the mainstream universe so you have all that you have all the stuff that was lingering because rogue kissed gambit during legion quest and then you find out what happened to them and there's all the, there's like people on different teams they've switched teams now and who's on x-force and x-force don't have a base and the setup is different there's all these hints of what's to come and i love stuff like that because that's the bit that sometimes the promise is better than the delivery <laughs> you know with these yeah. things but that's what these books that's what they're built for they're built to pull you in and intrigue you and make you want to keep buying and it was just one of those books that just worked for me i like dipping into it even though it's not one of the greatest comics of all time it works jeff matsuda brian hitch paul pelletier uh there's a there's a, a mike mccone you've got a ton of like now big name artists who were on this book who weren't necessarily the biggest names at the time so you do see some of their earlier work. It's it's just a fun book. And it's very 90s in that it's total sales. It's a complete sales pitch. But I love it. I love it because it's just balls out. Don't care. We want you hooked now after this big event. Don't walk away. We've got more to come. And I love that. My number five, I think, is a key X-Men moment. It goes back to uh, the early early nineties, ninety three. Oh, what did Omega Bread say? I see the face. I see Dave's face. Sorry, all the mysteries that were set up and paid off in that era were great, apart from the revelation that Professor X was a bit of a nonce. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> it's true. Uh, Professor oh. X, the truth always comes out. But my number, my number five is going to be X Men number twenty five. Famously known amongst comic fans is that moment that Wolverine loses the adamantium. Because it's like, duh, why wouldn't Magneto... Why like, hasn't this happened torture, before? <laughs> right? Talk yeah. about torture to torture. And this is at, at the end, pretty much close to the end of Fatal Attractions, right? This is like the yeah. final fight. Your thoughts when this happened in comics, when you saw this issue? Mine? Yeah. Do you know what? This not I didn't dislike it, but I will say there's one thing that always bothered me, and it's that he left the metal in sticking out of his body. He's being carried away, and he's got the metal sticking out, and then the, in the Wolverine 75, which comes afterwards, the metal's gone. And I never understood how that happened, you know? Good question. That's but good they've question. never fixed it or explained it or anything. But yeah, I thought they might do a page 
like where they would just kind of redo the art and just have it come out just take it out because it's not meant to be half stuck in half because i thought they were going to have it so that he was like now he's spiky because that's how it looks if you if you take a look back at the issue he doesn't completely pull it out who was the writer at that time was it fabian or scott loved i think it was fabian i think it was fabian i think fabian was doing x-men and libdell was doing uncanny if i remember rightly okay but it was it was great, and you're kind of wondering why it had never happened before. If you pair it off as well with Wolverine seventy five and the revelation that comes with that, even though most people know it, I'm not going to say it just because there might be some people who literally don't know. It's great. That's a great moment. Wolverine seventy five is probably the bit that trumps it for me partly as well because the Adam Kubert art on that. I wasn't a huge Andy Kubert fan at the time. I didn't start to like his art until Kazar. But I think, again, he had the wrong inker on X-Men. A lot of the time it was quite scratchy. And and everyone's faces look like uh, Olivia Wilde. Everyone looks like Olivia Wilde. <laughs> how How is Andy Kubert's art on the X-Men remembered, generally speaking, from fans that were reading it at the time? Is it well regarded? Because I know everything was being compared to what Jim Lee kind of set the standard for. Mm. And that became sort of the look of the decade I could, where everyone... I don't know. Because, like, I mean, at the time as well, like, there was no internet, so you couldn't really compare it. But a friend of mine was reading X-Men, and he'd never bought comics before. So he picked up X-Men number one, and he stayed with the book. And then he hit issue... He didn't realize Jim Lee wasn't drawing 12 and 13, because Art Tibbet did an impression of him. And then it got to 14, and he went, what's this art? I hate it. Well, it's horrible. What is it? And I went, yeah, there's a different guy. And then he went, is the other guy not coming back? I'm like, I think he's gone. <laughs> and he went, and why is it part three? Like, yeah, that's called a crossover. And he went, I'm done. And he just, that was it. Lost him forever. He never went back. So because of the Jim Lee because switch. Because of the, the art switch and because it was an event. Like, so I have to buy four comics a month and not one? Like, yeah, sorry, mate. Uh, um, that was the lot. But actually what they were doing at that point, the reason why they did that, extinct um, Executioner's Song was to try and keep the people that were leaving Marvel to follow the guys to Image. So that was designed to be that, except they went with Andy Cooper on the art. And I think that was a... I struggled with that shift. I wasn't keen hmm. on that. Because like, Jim Lee is a tough act to follow at the best of times, but follow with someone who can do detail. Yeah, see, I look, I go back and I read like Executioner's Song and I'm just like caught up in the nostalgia of 90s X-Men and my memory of how the cartoon looked. And it just, it's it's the kind of the, the Jim Lee and I guess those issues of X-Men when I would go into a comic book store, a convenience store on the on the racks, the spinner racks or in the shops, I, I remember seeing a lot of that q sort of art. So for me, it's like, I remember this as a kid. Yeah. So I'm I'm somewhat fond of it, uh-huh. but I didn't experience that shift of like, where the heck did my guy go? Like, yeah. Again, I everyone didn't... lost their feet. He didn't draw feet. He did a lot of smoke. Everyone was standing in smoke. Everyone was posing for everything. Everyone's kind of going, mm. and everyone's like, in a st- let's all stand on the stairs together. Okay, what? What's the news, Professor X? Like, why are you all on the stairs again, dudes? You're meant to be like, no one's cleaning anything here. Has anyone done the washing? Come on. True. And like, no, they're all posing. Every shot. When when you get when you read Blood Ties, when they get, they're told what happens on Genosha, they're literally all just posing. And it's like they're almost kind of like, we're we're in a catalogue. Mm-hmm. What's happening over there? It's it's weird. Um that's partly why I didn't really get on with his art. But it does improve a lot. I did I did like it later, but on X-Men, no. But again, I, I think it was it was the wrong inker for him. I can't remember who it was, but it, I don't think it was the best choice, best combination. Mm. Fair enough. Well, yeah, it's clear that uh, I got a I got a soft spot for for Wolverine, as well as the Fatal Attraction storyline. So, and a shout out to Peter David as Omega Bread brought up. It was thanks to him that we got that moment with the adamantium and, Ma- and Magneto. He was the one who threw it out there, seeing if it would stick. And at yeah. first, I think I think Fabian Nicias, when I had spoken to him, had said that uh, they dismissed it. But then it was kind of like, well, why not? Yeah. Because then you could go in this direction afterwards. And I think that's that's what was the exciting part is where you could take it. So Peter, yeah, David, Peter David was great for that at writer's things. He would do that all the time. Yeah, but why, why, why not just do that? And they go like, because you can't. Because then we've got to deal with it. But yeah, but think of the stories. He was doing it all the time. He was brilliant. 
That's why he the is, Hulk is so good. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Dave. Okay. You're number five. My number five, and this is why I knew you weren't going to do a steal. This is a random one. It's Uncanny X Men 375. Again, it wasn't one I was going to pick originally. I wanted to pick this whole storyline, but there's so many like sub crossovers in this era. But there was a point in time towards the end of the 90s, about 1998, 99, and they did a story called The Shattering. And they split the X Men up and they just, that's it. It's the end of the X Men. No one's sure if they can trust anyone. We're done. And we've seen that a thousand times. But a small band of X Men. So it was, it was Phoenix. Cyclops, uh, Nate Gray, Archangel, and Wolverine are uh, in the Astonishing X Men, which was the second series to be to have that title, and they were facing Death, the new Horseman of Apocalypse, the new Death, and it was them fighting each other. So it ends with, do I spoil? I kind of have to spoil it to talk about the issue, but I mean, I think it's not. Right. So Death kills Wolverine in the in issue three. So issue 375 deals with the death of Wolverine. So it's the autopsy issue. It's Adam Cuba on the art. The front cover is Wolverine. Straight away you see what's happened. It's it's Wolverine on a on the slab and he's about to be dissected to find out what happened to him. Is he dead? Is it what's going on here? But this whole thing is building up to a big twist. And it's the big twist that leads into Apocalypse the 12, which was the end of the millennium or the big, the beginning of the new millennium. Uh, yeah, story a lot of people felt like that didn't deliver on its promise, right? The Apocalypse the Twelve. They switched the ending. I think people started guessing the ending for storylines because that was when it was becoming more prominent for people to chat on the internet and go, mm. I reckon they're going to do this. And instead of going, just wait and see, they'd change it. They they did that with a couple of DC storylines. They did it with this one. I, I think uh, that's what happened. But I'm not 100%. Someone can correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, that's that's an interesting because yeah, a lot, I remember hearing people who had read that were really excited for it, everything leading up to it, and then it's just like, and then it just fell kind of flat, like it didn't deliver on all of that build up. But no. I haven't read it to to know. I still love it, and it's so it was a period as well where editorial messed with the writers so much because Joe Kelly and Steve Siegel left the X titles because they were sick of um, being told what they could and couldn't do. And then Alan Davis jumped on. So he was drawing one of the titles. He was writing both titles. And sometimes other people would fill in for him because it was a lot of work. And sometimes Chris Claremont would sneakily come back and write an issue, but no one knew. He wasn't credited. So mm. it, it was such a weird period. But it, do you know what, though? It was something the X-Men hadn't been in a while. And that was just, it was, is that word again? It was pure fun. It was very full color, brightly colored, exciting, big storylines. There's some laughs in it. There's some silliness in it, but it's all building up to like, this is the final battle with Apocalypse. Uh, but there's another element in woven in there, and it's the twist to Uncanny X-Men 375. It's it's an odd one. It's a really strange one. It's all collected in one big massive volume, which is this one, X-Men versus uh, uh, Apocalypse the 12. But you can get paperback versions of it as well. But it's best if you read all these things together because there's an ongoing thread in Wolverine. There's a cables involved there's stuff going on in in, in the build-up to this massive i'm gonna i am gonna do a reading on for this thing just because i love it so much i love it and i haven't read it since it came out but i have a real affection for this bit and i think it was partly because you get alan davis art you get adam cuba art and it's just it's upbeat x-men comics which is so rare because it's so often they're being so miserable <laughs> yeah sometimes you read the x-men and you're like what are they heroes of? Like, who are they saving? What? And yeah. sometimes it they are, and a lot of times it's just survival. Yeah. It's the chase. It's the running away. It's all of the... Or the internal drama. Yeah, exactly. There's so many things to... Where, places to go and things to pick. Don't be don't be like me and be afraid of where to jump in. Just jump in. You jump in. The, That's all you can do. It's going to be okay. Yeah, just jump in. <laughs> At any okay. moment, it's going to be okay. And uh, the the cool part about a lot of that era of comics is they because there was still so much continuity, they always would remind you. Yeah. They would catch you up. Yeah, they did. Yeah. Yeah. There was always that little extra dialogue or extra information. It's like, I know that already, but it was still like this could be someone's first comic. Yeah. It was still that idea, right? Because not everything was collected. No, or we very little was. Reading orders on the omniverse comics.guy. Good plug. 
Thumbs up right? to that. And speaking of <laughs> thumbs up, make sure you give us a like and hit subscribe. Hey. Well done. Boom. That was an alley-oop. <laughs> Man, I'm, now I want to just read my X-Men books. Let's go. Going back to the... Going back to... <laughs> Let's do more X-Men episodes, Dave. What are, what are the people saying? We've got... A couple of my um, favorites. A couple of his favorites and a big old list. And I'm loving it. Uh, BC Scrubs said that some of his favorite stories are Uncanny 268, which I was going to pick instead of 269. That's the Wolverine... Captain America, Black Widow, Madripoor story. Uncanny X-Men 275, which was an yeah, excellent choice, man. You've got fantastic taste. X-Men Blue and Yellow Costumes in Space with the Star Jammers. So that was 273 to 277, which is another one I nearly picked. Jump back and, and take a look at those. That is the best era of X-Men, I think. The 80s is just... The 80s into the early 90s is fantastic. It really... Yeah. There's so much stuff. Some of it's so ridiculous. It's yeah. great. That's the it's best great. part, right? It's like this is so... Yeah, when you're in Inferno and you're seeing a demonic mailbox, you're like, this is... What the hell is this? I love it. And where's her clothes? <laughs> and where's his clothes? Havoc yeah. in that outfit. What? So good. Yeah, no. Now I gotta read. All right, I gotta go and start my <laughs> X-Men reading. Okay, everybody. Uh, Dave, as always, and, and to the friends on Twitch, thanks for hanging out with us. Thank you. Everybody on the YouTube... Hit that rate and subscribe button, thumbs up, and all your other podcast platforms. Don't forget, omniversecomics.guide. <laughs>